and I, we're going to go through four parts in the presentation. We're going to do history of the project, a few things you need to know to understand where we are now. Then we are going to go a bit on how it works, uh, how the system is set up, because although many people here probably know already how it works, I, I hope there are new people here that we are converting to Dash today, and they, they need to see that. Then we'll go about why this system is better than other systems that are currently being used by other projects. And finally, we're going to dip into Dask or team governance, which many people may find interesting because it ties with everything and, and what we are doing. So history, it's important because it lets us understand where we are. As Martin Luther King said, we are not makers of history. We are made by history. So, there are three phases in the DAS project that I think is important to distinguish. The early days, uh, this photo is real, by the way. Um, there was no funding. Uh, today, for some people, this is unbelievable. With all these ICOs being launched, we're just a group of um, volunteers uh, doing this out of pure passion. Um, and we, we didn't get paid. We, we even paid to work. We asked for donations sometimes to support travel expenses or tools we were using, but there was absolutely no funding and we ran like that for more than a year. Evan Duffield was the, was the motor of all these phase and he had committed two years to work full time for the project. He quit his job to launch this and he committed two years without any kind of payment to, to run the show. There was no real organization. Obviously, if you are not paying people, you can't uh, manage them properly because they are just volunteers. You can't require for things, but you need to ask uh, and, uh, and say a lot of please and thank you. And you have to do that when you pay them but also. But uh, you need to, people only work in the things they like and the things that are boring or they don't like then don't get attended. So we needed to change from that. Many people here in the room uh, were back then and, and they know how frustrating it was to try to do things and don't have the money, have to ask the community for funds. It was really hard, but it also made us lean and made us smart. And I think all those projects that are not running through this kind of phase today are weaker because of that. One, one of the things that uh, we went through at that time was we saw the Bitcoin Foundation as an example. Maybe we could spin up a foundation, receive some funding that way. We started the Dash Foundation. Really, very little came in uh, through memberships and so on. And we found that the, the volunteer model or the donation-based model was really hard to do. And we've seen it with the Bitcoin Foundation. You know, uh, donations drop every year. It, it really is kind of other people riding your coattails when you're asked to do a donation-based model. So that's one of the key learnings here from the 2014-2015 period. So then we go to what we call the pro-am phase. That was 2015, early 2016, no, most of 2016 and late 2015. Uh, the Treasury was launched, the system we have now of proposals and funding for the project. Evan came up with that and it was polished and on launch. In the beginning, the budget was really small because the price was small because the system works as a percentage of the new coinage. So we had just some little money, but that was a huge difference. We could start giving tokens of appreciation to the people involved with the project, and that felt really good. It was not real salary, but that felt good. Um, most proposals were still being done by the, by the core team, but also we started to see smaller proposals popping up and new teams uh, working around us because uh, they, 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 they saw the potential in, in this system. Um, some people in the team started quitting their day jobs. Um, people who had high paying jobs started leaving everything just to work for DAS and that showed real commitment. And the process of professionalization started. Back then, Ryan started to act as the CEO of the team, even if at, the, at that time he was the CFO, and started to chase us to do things that real companies do because we were starting to 
act as a real company. You can give a glimpse on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, the process of professionalization is ongoing for us, but, um, and we'll talk more about some of the things that we're doing to continue in that process. But when I joined the team full time, there were a lot of issues that we were facing. Um, the budgets were not being proactively managed. So one month, a good portion of the budget might go unused. And the very following month, we had a bunch of expenses that the budget couldn't cover. And so we started to collaborate as a team and pull together all of the ideas that we had and start to prioritize them against how well are they aligned against our strategic goals? How uh, urgent are they? And how much of an impact can they have on uh, our community, on our price? Because if, we, if, if it's a, some, something that would increase our price, we could then have more budgets the next month and more resources to be able to address more of our strategic goals. So we started pri prioritizing those things and then slotting them in as the budget allowed. Highest priority, most urgent, and most aligned with our strategic vision came first. And we started to get a lot more out of our budget. And then we were able to start to do things like uh, differentiate between the tokens of appreciation that we were handing out to team members based on contribution levels. Uh, starting to prioritize external investments into companies looking to integrate with Dash, adding value to our ecosystem of, and, and our users to be able to do things with Dash that they couldn't do before. And so this process of professionalization kind of extended through the end of 2016. The beginning of this year, when the price really started to explode, uh, we started to really organize ourselves from legal standpoints, from organizational standpoints, uh, getting org structure, reporting structures in place, um, fleshing out our onboarding process. Um, this process is ongoing. Robert does a lot of the work here in the project management office uh, to, to help us create processes behind all of the activities that we have going on, reporting. And so we are evolving into a very effective organization. And so this year, when the price exploded, we went from something like 10 beginning of the year, $10 per DAS, to current like 350 Obviously, that had a huge reflect on our budget. On the budget, it's not ours. It's the, it's the network's budget. But uh, we, we went into the seven-digit territory per month to invest in the project. That made a huge difference. We uh, saw how the number of proposals and teams started started to grow. Some of those teams are here producing uh, news. Uh, we started to bring in new people we could not afford before. Uh, some of them in this room, and, and they, they were expensive because they are great. And we, we, we poached people from amazing projects uh, around the world, and we brought in great software developers. The team started to grow a lot, and that is making a, a, a huge difference. Um, also, we've seen and we have to acknowledge that in some ways, that there have been some uh, failed proposals, and that is okay. That's a learning process. We've seen uh, that uh, certain things don't work, other things work, and the community and um, the, the master notes are learning what should be funded at what and what not. And it's great that it has happened slowly because uh, mistakes are cheaper this way than if you um, go big from, from the beginning. And this is where we are. This is, uh, this is the, the place we are at now. So in, on the waste issue, um, there, there have been proposals that have been put up and failed to deliver. Um, there have been proposals where um, the value wasn't, wasn't necessarily there, even if, it, if, if the goals of it were achieved. The master owners are learning from this. And there are changes taking place in the expectations of a proposal. The professionalism expected from your proposal is going up. They generally want to know who you are in real life. They like it if you're a real company. Um, they like it if you uh, actually enter into an illegal contract with the Dash Core team to escrow your funds until you, you deliver the goods. Um, they like it if you uh, provide some mechanisms of control over what it is that you're doing. So, the master nodes are learning some of these things, and I think proposal owners are starting to learn it too, as to what it yep. takes and what the expectations are that lower the risk for the network. As Fernando said, this learning is good 
because if we came out with a big ICO at the beginning and had millions of dollars to spend, there would have been a lot more waste. But we started with $2 coins and $14,000 budgets. That was cheap learning. And now we're much more effective with that budget. So as how a it network. works will go a bit into that. Because the system is much more simple than what most people believe. In the end, it's just that the incentives are aligned. But it's also super powerful. As an early developer said, feel the force. We had to fire him because he kept speaking backwards and the team was going crazy. Um, so how it works, it's super easy. Uh, part of the blog reward is reserved for investment in the project. That's as simple as that. 10% of every new block is reserved for this. It's kept in the system and then it's created at the end of the month when the budget cycle ends. And that's a big difference with other projects. And then anyone can make a proposal and ask for funding. And a proposal is just a name and a number. The only thing that you are asking is for money. And in the network, you only have a name. Then other sites have created all these systems in parallel so you can have more information on your proposal and give information to the masters, like that central. By the way, big kudos to Rango for creating that site. And, uh, but the in the network, you don't need to create something super complex to store information. This is just a name and a number. And then the master notes vote. And they say yes or no, or they can abstain. Uh, and that's all they say. Um, and this is important because in the beginning, a, a part of those mistakes uh, were things like people making proposals so someone else did something. And the system is not prepared for that. The system is just funding. It's you, you want to do something, we will, the system will fund it. There is no way to compel to anything. That's why we had to put those other mechanisms um, in place to to correct so, small so on this one, if the master nodes put up a proposal and say the court dash core team is going to create a, 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 a certain website that does something illegal, we're not compelled to do it. This is just a voting system that determines where the funding goes. So the proposal receiver of those funds is the one that gets to dictate things and, and uh, gets to decide how to implement something. We leave it to the experts. We are not crowdfunding decisions about how to implement things. An example of this is we put up a proposal for funding of uh, a marketing campaign. We're very proud to be working with Ogilvy and Mather. They're one of the big four uh, marketing firms. And we're starting out with a trial run. They're going to be uh, doing our branding and um, uh, an initial uh, digital marketing campaign. But people don't get to actually vote on, well, how does that money get spent? Where, you know, what type of ads are going to be run? What will the logo look like? We're leaving those decisions to experts, people who deeply understand the psychology of a brand and, and that type of thing. And so this is a lot like shareholders appointing someone to go do something. They don't get to tell them how to do their jobs. They try to install experts to go do those jobs in as professional a way as possible. And then when the proposal gets approved, the owner gets the money directly from, from the blockchain. There are no intermediaries. This is really powerful. When you are getting paid from the system, no one is handing you the money. The system, the masternodes are giving you that. And that's, that's huge, we believe. So the system, we believe, we, we know it's better than other systems that are currently being used to, to fund other projects. And because there is no presentation which is complete without the sex joke, there goes the next quote. My milkshake like, brings all the boys to the yard and they're like, it's better than yours. Damn right, it's better than yours. <laughs> this is a song from, from the from early century for the youngsters around here. And yeah, our system brings all the best devs to the yard and they say, our <coughs> das is better than yours. Damn right, it's better than yours. We have a system that has let us hire amazing people and has let us get where we are now. And we can, we're going to compare briefly with two other systems that are being used. The donations and sponsorship 
uh, system. We had this in the beginning. We even created our own foundation. And the problem with this system is that you lose independence. Whoever is paying the bills um, has power. I'm not saying that developers in other projects like Bitcoin only obey to, their, uh, to the company they are, they are getting paid from. But obviously, you, you are going to have those needs in your head because you are not independent. You are not uh, paid directly by the protocol you are developing. And that's a big minus, in our opinion. And also, reliability. Donations and sponsorships can dry up. And then what? There is no more money, and now what? Um, you had the numbers for the Bitcoin Foundation. Uh, oh, uh, what they got last year. It was yeah. Last year's uh, Form 990 that they registered was under $125,000. So, so most of the development expenses for for Bitcoin and practically all all of these projects um, is coming from donations of people's time or corporations that are sponsoring them. Uh, also, MIT I think sponsors two developers. Yeah. So, in the end, you are begging for money from people, and that comes with a cost. And also a distraction, because uh, you need to be raising money all the time, and, and that costs time and energy. And the other system we are seeing, it's the, the rates right now. Every Bitcoin conference right now is about ICOs, and they're great. They're, they're really, it's, it's, it's an amazing system to, to get funds. I mean, startups being able to uh, get so much money at the beginning of their uh, history, it's great because it allows you to do a lot of things and to be fast in execution, but it has also a lot of problems associated with that. In our system, we believe, is much robust because it pays to whoever is delivering value. It doesn't pay to to whoever launched the project, like in an ICO, they pay to whoever is uh, delivering the value at the moment because it's being generated in every block. Um, the funding allocation can switch from one need to another one because the project is going to change while you develop. It's also fair to newcomers. One of the big problems in, in crypto, I believe, is that if you are not there early, you don't have any incentive to, to work for the project. It's much more profitable to launch a new one because only the, the holders are going to profit from your, from your work. Uh, with this, we can pay people what they should get so, uh, what, for, for the work. So it's, it, it lets you bring new people. And it's sustainable because it's going to happen all through the life of the project. So you don't need to be... Uh, thinking on new ways to get money. Uh, ICO money is great, but what will happen when it dries up? You spend what you had and you don't have a new method to, to raise new money. We have that in every block. We, we are starting to see some ICOs doing second rounds, uh, which dilutes the existing coin holders. Um, so no one has yet solved that question as to what happens after the ICO money is depleted. What happens to the development then? Do you switch to a, a model where you're um, asking for donations again? Do you dilute everyone with an additional round? Um, and so I, I think until that question is answered, um, we, we really believe that this is a superior way to go. And a lot of thought has gone into how we actually structure this. And also, it's regulation safer. Nothing is completely safe, but a lot of ICOs are really selling securities. SEC has already said they are looking into it. China has temporarily banned them. So ICOs can give you trouble. In our case, um, we don't um, fulfill the requirements to be considered a security. This is much simpler and, and safer for, for the project. And we, we actually fail uh, on two of the components of the Howey test that determine whether or not you're a security. Absolutely every dash that has ever been created was not sold. It was given to someone, either a master node operator or a miner or someone putting a proposal up to the uh, network to provide some work in exchange for that. No money has ever gone into some central organization. Um, they are all compensation for work efforts. And so we believe it's much more uh, outside of the regulatory 
uh, frameworks that exist today. And this is important because some projects that have already launched and are working can have trouble down the road because regulation and, and, and law enforcement is slow, but they move. And, and they are already giving signals, and they will move. So being, a, being safer, it's great for all the ecosystem and for all us also, obviously. And finally, the DAS core team governance, uh, which is something that uh, many people ask, and sometimes they identify the core team with the DAS project, and that's not the case. The DAS core team is just one team working for the project. There are other teams, there are other people doing great things for, for DAS. And another Game of Thrones reference, I didn't know there was one in, in the first presentation, but this is a team play. The lone wolf dies and the pack survives. We are a team. There are a lot of people giving everything for the project, and that's what made it possible. People that were here at the beginning, people that are arriving now, uh, everyone is important. We are organized uh, in, the, in the core team uh, very specifically to work for the network as a team, and, and the spirit is always great. So one few words on, the, on how the team is structured and then how we have that set up. Uh, we have 50 people already, and this doesn't include translators, because uh, those are a lot and it's a different job, but 50 people working for the project and getting paid from the blockchain. I don't know if there are more teams as big as ours in the crypto space, and we're growing and we uh, are always looking for new people. Our recruiter is going crazy. In fact, we've hired a, a recruiter to have in-house because we have uh, the need to, for new people, by the way. Anyone that wants to get involved in that, please reach out. We have many positions to cover. And then we have the project teams with their leads, and then we have a board, and, and, and everything is funded from the blockchain, and we could be fired because we could just get our funding pulled out. So it's a great structure. And, and then how, how, how we've set this up. We have a US company, that hires people and signs contracts and there's into economic relations because obviously when you are out there trying to get integrations, trying to do work, you need to sign contracts. You need to be a real actor with legal presence in the real world. We all love the internet, we almost live there, but we need to be able to do that kind of stuff, have a bank account, so we have that. Then we've set, we're setting up at the moment the New Zealand Trust administered from Switzerland that, that owns the shares of that company. So we are not, we don't own the company. The network does because the beneficiary of that trust is the DAS network. So we don't own anything. We in the team are just employees and this system gives everything back to the network. And that trust, by the way, will also own any kind of intellectual property or patents that along the way we need to register. Anyway, we'll do that openly and assign those to the public. Everything will be open. We are still an open source project. We will always be. But uh, it's true that even other open source projects need to sometimes fill some patents and assign them to whoever it is. Uh, so others don't do that for you and then uh, give you a hard time. We started this process back in January, and it's extremely complicated. Uh, we're doing things that no other project has ever done before. We've driven our lawyers absolutely nuts, our advisors absolutely nuts, working out every little detail, and they've had to research things that we're asking them to do. We want to make sure that ultimately we're accountable so that after Fernando and myself and the rest of the core team are gone, and they've been replaced by other people, that there's accountability built into the system at a level that no other project has, even those that do have trust, how does the network make sure and hold those people accountable and allow them to be replaced in a sustainable way? And so we're setting this up for the long term. Yeah, and just the fact that the beneficiary of the trust is the DAS network, that's revolutionary. That's what Ryan was saying. We are innovating in this, but using traditional structures that were already in place. So I think with that, we can uh, build for the future and have a system that will work out for a lot of time. You need more info, there are a few links, our social media presence, sites, or whatever you can. There's, the, the, the room is full of people from the team. Most of the ones with the dust t-shirt are 
involved <laughs> how. So feel free to reach out, any information you need, um, contact us anywhere, and, and we'll be happy to provide. Sorry for eating into the coffee break. Uh, and if we knew that Fernando was going to rap for us, I bet we <laughs> would have sold a lot more tickets. So thanks for that.